2024 has started with more survival crafting games than you can poke a stick at. So far we've had the wildly successful PAL World, a Pokemon themed survival game. We've had Enshrouded, a fantasy Zelda inspired survival game. And now comes Nightingale, a Victorian era steampunk Stargate dimension hopping survival game that's released in early access. Once I heard the premise, I was eager to see what exactly this game was all about. The combination of ye olde steampunk and dimensional gateways. What sort of gear were they smoking to come up with that? I will admit that some of the buildings in the trailer looked pretty great. And I was excited to roll up my digital sleeves and see what imaginative builds I could give birth to. You suck! It turns out I can't build for sh**. Nightingale was developed by Inflection Games, who are made up of a bunch of exiles from Bioware Studios. You might have heard of them. Dragon Age, Mass Effect, Knights of the Old Republic. Yeah, that's pretty good credentials in my book. But Nightingale isn't an RPG. They're stepping into the murky depths of survival crafters. Cooperative survival crafters too. You can play this solo or with friends, although personally I've only played this game single player. The story shares pretty similar themes to Enshrouded. Humans learned about gateway travel and magic from the Fae, then messed around with it to the point where we all screwed it up, released some kind of evil which wiped out a whole bunch of different worlds, and closed the gateways that both humans and Fae were using to travel around. The last human city left standing is Nightingale, and our character's main goal is to get back to it by world jumping with help from a curiously helpful Fae named Puck, whose voice acting is so good and is easily one of my favourite things about this game. Play them and let amiable bond be drawn between Fay and Fleshling. He's basically John Hurt doing Shakespeare in cosplay, and I'm really here for it. After being shown through a few tutorial realms with Puck guiding the way, you get to choose your starting realm, the place where you'll likely set up your base. The gateways work a little like Stargates. You dial up a world by combining two categories of realm cards, a biome card and a major card. There are only three biomes currently in early access, forest, swamp and desert. When Puck asked, I chose to base myself in the forest because swamps smell bad and deserts have sand, and we all know about sand. It's coarse, and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. The other category of cards are the major cards. These have weird names like Abeyance, Astrolabe and Providence, and they represent progressively difficult realms and therefore potentially higher grade loot. So I started in the Forest Abeyance realm. Each biome has environmental hazards to overcome and different and often strange wildlife. The creature designs have wonderful variability and it does a good job of a believable ecosystem, really when you can see predators hunting prey in the wilds. The visuals are gorgeous. It's such a looker that I can imagine this being fodder for a cheeky screenshot here and there. I started setting up base near the water, but pretty soon realised it would probably be more convenient to build near the gateway. I like the building system and parts of the crafting too. Building consists of putting down a blueprint, and once you're happy with the design, pour resources into it to complete. It's reminiscent of the forest, and it mostly works. The crafting is a bit different. There's a workbench, a campfire, a sewing table, a mortar, a smelter, a carpentry station, a potion table, an enchanter, a masonry workstation, and that's just what I've unlocked so far. It goes on and on and on. I'm about 15 hours in, but I've already got close to 10 different crafting stations. And then there's the augment system. Similar to Valheim, you can build add-ons that need to be nearby particular benches to upgrade them to be able to craft higher level or different things. So with 10 benches and about double that in augments, my house starts to look like that set of the TV show Hoarders. Once base is set, the game starts to open up a bit more. The majority of game time is spent exploring the different realms. The worlds I've travelled to have elicited a few oohs and ahs at the colour contrasts and the weird animals that I've come across. What the f*** is that? There's predominantly two things you'll be doing while you realm walk. Combat and puzzle solving. Let's talk combat. I found the combat to be tedious. Hitboxes for both melee and ranged combat feel inconsistent. I was mostly using a two-handed maul, sometimes an axe, and occasionally the slingshot. And with the slingshot, I would try for a headshot as they were running at me and feel confident in some of my shot placements and just absolutely not register. I found it such a chore, and I wondered whether it would be better in third person. It wasn't. In fact, I found it worse. I think the crosshair in third person is a bit misleading, and I did in the end much prefer the first person combat. I've started to unlock some of the magic system, which consists of enchantments that you imbue your gear with. I've got my two-handed maul that I've upgraded with a self-heal that I use on occasion when I'm bored of chucking the plentiful and instantly working health potions. So the combat's pretty mid. What about the puzzles? 
Yeah, I didn't think much better of them. Currently, there's really only two different kinds of puzzles I've come across in the different worlds. It's either smack the crystals in the correct order, or find the fairy graffiti. That's it. You complete the sequence, the Jedi holocron opens up, you get the refractory plumbus or the synchronized phlegmon, and then you move on to the next point of interest and you do exactly the same thing again. To progress to higher level worlds, you need to improve your gear score, which functions as your level. You do so by crafting and upgrading your weapons and armor at your 652 different workstations, and when this reaches a minimum level, you're able to enter these temples and fight a boss for the next tier of major card, from Antiquarian, Astrolabe, Providence, and Herbarium, in that order, I think. From what I'm hearing, the end game is pretty good, but I'll be honest, I've now spent 15 tedious hours in game of doing so much unengaging combat and touching so much fairy graffiti. I'm, I'm kind of done. I mean, maybe past end game there's amazing creatures and the combat really opens up with amazing different puzzles and flying mounts that are cool and breathe smoke and fart orange juice. But why would you do this, Nightingale? Do you hate me? Am I being punished for wanting a fun time straight away? How many hours do I have to donate to a game nowadays to be considered worthy of it lifting its metaphorical skirt? I could be wrong, but I think the big selling point of this game was the endless discovery and traveling to different realms. Now, I've traveled to all the biomes, I've modified the world, day, night, difficulties, weather, low gravity. The differences feel kind of shallow. Sure, at first I agree they're visually spectacular, enticing even. You run around and go, whoa, look at that, I want to check that out. And then you go there and think, cool, it looks like that thing I saw in the last world I was in. Oh, it's the same puzzle with more graffiti on the same game asset. And then the illusion shatters. You're visiting supposedly amazingly different worlds that consist of a combo of maybe five different points of interest with two different types of puzzle in three different biomes. It's all superficial flavors that you've dialed up in a gateway. You've just ordered the chicken or the beef with the hot yen or the soba noodles and the minor modification card of duck sauce or honey sauce. You've ordered shitty noodles. It's a shallow bucket of assets, making each world geographically feel very similar. The creatures were probably the only thing that kept me guessing. I enjoyed the weird animals I found, and that was probably the only thing that would keep me progressing. And look, I can hear you say, it's in early access, give it a break. And yes, that's partly true. The devs have even said that they'll be adding more biome and major cards over time, so the variety will increase. But more biomes won't fix the lack of puzzle diversity, the unengaging combat, and the slow feeling of progression. Other titles have released in early access from much less qualified studios that are in better condition than Nightingale. I'm not sure this is currently worthy of them. I do genuinely hope that through early access some of these things are addressed, because I think the concepts they're aiming for are really interesting ideas. Last thing I'll mention is the always online component of the game. Yes, you can currently only play this online even if you're solo. There were a few initial server drops when I started playing and it was often when I was realm jumping. That was pretty irritating. But I feel like this has improved slightly for me since release. I also note that devs are working on an offline only mode. I've mostly forgiven this as a quirk of data collection in its early access state, but certainly once this gets to 1.0, I would really hope there's an offline mode by then. Overall, Nightingale has a really interesting premise of Victorian steampunk dimension jumping with nifty ideas of realm card combinations. But for me, it's let down by lackluster combat and a shallow exploration experience with repetitive, boring puzzles and not enough surprises to keep me playing. It's currently in early access, so he is hoping the devs make some changes to the exploration options and the variety of puzzles. But for now, I don't see myself revisiting Nightingale anytime soon.